I actually did one of those polygram tests one time and every time death was mentioned it rose quite high. I, I don't like talking about it. Probably because it's so final. No, it's, I suppose it's a bit of a taboo subject, isn't it? No one's, uh, everyone's afraid of the unknown. You know, they find it difficult to talk. And, you know, if there's someone in your family that's dying, people don't like to talk to him. People seem to disappear when people are dying. In 2011, the London boroughs of Lambeth and Southwark witnessed three remarkable theatre events. They were aimed at getting the people of London to talk more about a subject most of us prefer to avoid. I think they're frightened to talk about death, aren't they? They're scared to talk about people dying. I want to live forever. <laughs> Commissioned by Guy's and St Thomas's Charity through the Modernisation Initiative End of Life Care Programme, arts charity Rosetta Life produced a series of participatory performance shows to raise public awareness amongst Londoners about death and dying. When my husband died, it took me five years to come o overcome. Working through care homes and with a wide range of London's ethnic minorities, Rosetta Life enabled partnerships between the Modernisation Initiative, the British Museum, the National Theatre Studio, Southwark Theatre and a group of highly skilled actors, musicians and designers. But I just saw a butterfly. Little you were lucky. But the real stars of the project were the care home residents themselves. Chocolate factory! Biggest worry is that if he passes away, I will be... And the elderly men and women who attend the South Asia Centre in Peckham. And that really worries me in life. The Basara Centre in Streatham. <laughs> and the black elderly group in Southwark. <laughs> Encouraged to speak about dying, these participants began to reflect on the significant events of their whole lives. Number 28, you go there, there is a man staying there. Well, he wasn't at the funeral, was he? Death was no longer something hush-hush at the end of life. They all hated him. But inseparable from the vibrant lives that preceded it. Very sad. And not content with sharing their views in the safe environment of workshops, participants summoned the courage to present their personal stories in public. And what happened down so Ah. <laughs> A process of openly performing themselves that validated lives that were approaching the final act. The whole world smiles with you. This short film explores the processes that led to the final production of the project, Let the Wind Carry Me Home. The show was performed to pack houses at Southwark Theatre in March 2011. About three or four months ago, my manager said to me, he said, Lucinda's coming up, let's sit together, we're telling the stories. And I asked, what's it all about? When I got the detail what it was, I just couldn't wait to do it. Because it's a fantastic opportunity to give us to somebody at this age to tell them a story. An aspect that was a bit scary was the fact that we had so much material, so many stories, and they were all very good. Either very upsetting, very funny. Next morning, me and my sister, we walk out. So near the graveyard, there was little steam. I saw the head floating. I loved the way that everybody felt able to share their, their, to, the stories that were important. And clearly, some of them were very raw and, and painful for them, but they were willing to share it. And that's because it felt safe in that environment. I really got scared, and up to now, I'm still very you know, scared. I got that very strong memory. And that had great, great power because when you see that it's important to that person, it really has impact. I'm holding on my story for the last 58 years, holding it back. Given an opportunity to say in public, it was absolutely fantastic, brilliant. Like many people in the audience, I was completely overwhelmed at the end of each performance. It was very emotionally engaging without being intense or melancholic. The play began with memories of the journey to Britain. Eleven days on the boat. I don't like the sea because I can't hold on to it. And first impressions of a strange new home. 
I thought the snow was salt. <laughs> the trees are dead. No, they're only sleeping. How am I going to Camberwell? What everybody remembered was the confusion over what bus to take. What bus do I take? Drell. Three, four, three. And as stories of the new life emerged, I'll take a cab. People recalled their first jobs. I worked in a factory. Chocolate factory. Sewing factory. Garment factory. Plastic factory. Shoe factory. Jewelry factory. Ford factory. <laughs> Printing books. Right, ladies and gentlemen, visas and passports at the ready. I don't want you fiddling in your bags. I want them ready right now. So next, please. Encouraged to share recollections, our participants quite quickly risked getting up on their feet. <laughs> to reenact the ordeal of passport control. Few realised that within a few weeks they'd be performing these experiences in public. Okay, go on. Thank you. This is very good. You can go straight through. Thank you. But arriving in Britain was not without its regrets. I miss the sun. I miss the help. The only time I return is when someone dies. And with these came recollections of death and the impact of the funeral pyre. I was 14 years old when my grandfather died. Being the eldest male, it was my duty to protect his funeral pyre. I sat there for 28 hours until, along with all his possessions, his body was gone. Memories of a cremation prompted reflections on mortality. Buried at sea. Buried in a lead coffin. Buried at home. Buried in the garden. Buried in the Thames. I want to be cremated. The wind will carry me home. The funny thing is, as soon as we talked about death, or dying, or being buried, or people they've lost, the stories that came out were mostly about living and, um, and memories, memories from a, a very early past. <laughs> when you talk about anything, you talk about its polar opposite. So, to, to, so you talk, talk about death, you talk about weddings and births, and that was really natural. The first time people tell stories is to one another, to their next door neighbour in a circle. The, and there was only eight or nine people in my marriage ceremony. Including us two. <laughs> By talking one to one and in groups, and carefully recording what was said, the basis of a script began to emerge. My marriage is a arranged marriage, and we never met each other before. We never, we never saw him. Only, only the picture. And then in rehearsals, they tell it again. So slowly, 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 there are step-by-step -step choices that they, where they're given the chance to gain confidence and to recognise that they can perform in a public space. It doesn't happen overnight. I think it is a big deal to get people that have never performed later on in their life to do something completely new. I am not afraid of anybody except policemen. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal for anyone. It's, it's a big deal exposing yourself in any way. And I fight with my life. My life was critical condition. But what's significant about this process is that it happens over a long time. I'd like to say thanks to Lucinda for helping us to bring back our good memories, bad memories, sad memories, and all the memories. <laughs> In gaining confidence, people gain the confidence, perhaps, to perform their stories publicly. And the role of the professional actors is to create spaces where the stories of the participants can best be brought to light. Judith? Yeah? Could you just come here a second, please? Yeah. I knew my my husband, since he was four years old. We used to be in this group of youth boys and girls. So we said we'd go for a picnic. So we came. I think it proves a couple of things, that it's never too late. Also that, as a group, you find strength. What's this? Is that for me? You surprise yourself. So while we were waiting, my husband had this tube of polo mints. So he offered everybody and he offered me. And then he took, took the uh, foil wrapper twisted it, folded it, and twisted it into a ring frame. And surprise, surprise, he gave it to me. Four years later, we got married. Mom, mm -hmm. I 
love it here. I'm going to live in Africa forever. Your father and I have been talking, and it's time you got married. We've been speaking to your auntie, and she has found you a lovely, handsome man. He lives in Calcutta, and he's very well educated. And Me? We... Married? To a man in Calcutta? And I think the most important thing was that the actors, myself as the director, James as the musician, we were artists, yes, but the groups, the participants, they were artists as well. They were part of the process. They were the storytellers. They were the script writers. You getting married. What I loved about it is you went to India from uh, Africa to meet him. Yeah. And you took one look at his poor clothes and his poor room yeah. and thought, I'm not then, marrying him, he doesn't look yeah, very nice. Yeah, because we are in one bedroom only. <laughs> Kitchen, <laughs> room, toilet, <laughs> one, only one. So we were all artists together. And because we had that equality, um, we did just have conversations quite naturally. Your parents said, he's very well educated, he'll do well, don't worry. And he wooed you in words for four years and yeah. then you fell in love with his letters. I yeah. love it. Four years to every week let love letters and I then agree to marry him. I think this kind of work is absolutely crucial to young artists as well as established artists. It keeps you in touch with the stories of real life people. And then? And then? And you have a very immediate and honest response to what you're making, what you're acting. We, we were, were married! married. <laughs> I've never experienced anything like it. It has completely changed my perspective on life and the people I meet. And I, I'm really appreciative of how open everybody has been. Um, and I felt, I felt very much part of your family. And as a performer, it's, it's just been a different element. I've used my performance skills, but it's been a collaborative process with everybody else. So it's, it is and it will remain one of the highlights of anything that I've been part of. So thank you. I think it's hearing personal stories and hearing um, real things about uh, people that in the street we might not say hello but to actually find out real stories about how people traveled from you know how they left loved ones then the tragedies the, the things that people have gone through every night my dreams were full of stories and i just found it so moving okay okay back to work we had our fun we couldn't possibly deliver this kind of project without a very complex brokering of partnerships. The project itself is the sum of those partnerships. Yes, absolutely. You have the National Theatre and the National Theatre Studio literally a stone's throw from, from St Thomas's Hospital. And then again, not far from the Asian Community Centre, uh, which is uh, on the border of the same borough. So you have all these three different organisations and establishments, but never probably speak to each other. The Asian elderly groups <laughs> provided the people who made and shaped the performances. But what we'll do is we'll show you the scene and see what you think, and then we can... The National Theatre Studio provided the professionalism of the artists that enabled us to shape a public performance. The Southwark Playhouse provided the stage and a box office to help us manage that stage and venue. This one! This one come test! I think it's brilliant, it's brilliant that we've done that. Brought three groups of people that would never probably interact um, and bring them together and get them to, to riff like a jazz band. Uh, I lost my evening. Uh, could Where? everybody please have a little look for me? Have a look underneath everything. The Modernisation Initiative's End of Life Care programme has set an agenda for transforming end of life care that created a political framework within which we shape the processes. What I think uh, the Modernisation Initiative and the Rosetta Life did, it challenged us to really think more about end-of-life care, to open up that conversation. Calm down, it's okay. 
think that people who came there and out and saw the performances are now talking. We have peer supporters. It's taking us right from the very beginning to the end and being able to see that as a continuum. That was one of the last times I saw my son. Four years ago, my son got married and after two days, my eldest son <coughs> passed away. I was sleeping in the morning, early morning Sunday, 1st of April. I was sleeping and one of my nephew came up to, up to me and woke me up and said, Shahid, he fell down in the bathroom. And I ran downstairs and I saw him on the floor. He's my eldest son and I love him and he's very close to me. I think we were getting closer to the person. So death and dying became about reflecting. Mommy! <laughs> reflecting about stories that they hadn't talked about for a long, long time. They're saying I don't have a mommy. Stories that were really difficult, like stories that came out of partition as well as stories about losing people in their family, loved ones. So death and dying in relation to other people. Can you tell us what happened in the playground that day? I was playing in the playground and the children said to me, I haven't got my mum, where's my mum, where's my mum? In the process of making this play, groups of Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus came together and shared stories about the deaths they'd witnessed in partition and that in itself was an incredibly healing experience for all of those involved and for the audience. And, uh, my parents are lost in the partition and my father died in the camp. So all that time you thought that... I thought I brought my mum. But really she was your... She my sister. She brought me up. Thank you. Let the Wind Carry Me Home shows how the creative arts can help people open up conversations around death and dying. 1952 I came home from school. I was 12 years old. And the street where I came was very quiet. I didn't know why the neighbourhood was so quiet. And you can see from that modernisation initiative work with Rosetta Life that people can talk about it. It shouldn't be a taboo subject. And I walked down and I saw my neighbours coming out of my house. With the help of actors, writers and filmmakers, people welcome the chance to share their stories with a wider audience. She said, um, come in here, good I, do, I just think that hearing the voice of people and understanding that people have a voice is so fundamental. And she said, no, come on, I want to talk to you. She took me around the corner and she said, your mum just died. And my first thought was who was going to look after my brother, he was only nine. That's when I had to grow up and start looking after my brother. And that was the saddest thing in my life I ever noticed. At 12 I had no mum and I did every job I could do. The hardest job was to cycle to the market, get bags of oranges, bring it to the town, and sell it to the public so I can keep myself and my brother. Telling your story in public offers a diverse range of groups a powerful voice in the community. It's a voice that will be noticed by local media, and it will open doors to collaborations with other arts groups and voluntary organisations. Finally, the air at the end when they talked about where they'd like to be buried. I like to be buried in Bethlehem next to my husband. I like to be cremated. And we could have made assumptions. We could have said, oh, you just want to be buried locally. I like to be buried in the country I died. I like to be cremated in South London. All of those things were all so individual, so different. I like to be cremated in India. How could we make a kind of decision about what somebody wanted if we didn't understand their individualities? I like to be buried next to my son. I'd like to be buried in Medina Nobara, inshallah. And yet it wasn't something that was frightening. It wasn't something that everybody collapsed in talking about. So it challenged that taboo that we can't talk about it. When I die, I want to be buried as a Muslim. I would like to be buried in Atlanta. 
one of the most important elements of our well-being is actually cultural and social engagement. My ashes scattered across the mountains. Coming together every week, meeting other people, having the chance to work alongside artists as artists is a hugely important part of our health and well-being. Buried in the garden. Buried in the Thames. I want to be cremated. The wind will carry me home. I think it's really important for a wider public audience to see people who aren't often visible. We need to see those people performing centre stage. We need to see them as active, engaged, dynamic, culturally significant thinkers and contributors to our debates. I don't want an expensive funeral, I want something cheap and cheerful sit me in a box, burn me and sort of scatter me somewhere. I don't want to be kept on somebody's mantelpiece, but I don't want to spend money on a mahogany coffin or anything like that. I think it's an absolute rip-off. To have lively, hyper music, everyone to have a laugh and be drinking before they get into the Cherish Chapel. <laughs> I think that would be my ideal wake, yeah. I don't want no one to wear black, that's all I think. I just want everyone to enjoy my life, what I had.